Hello once again, everybody, and thank you for joining me here on this Tuesday, December 29th edition of ATS Radio. I'm your host, Adam Burke. I'll be joined today by Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. We're going to talk week 17 of the NFL regular season, talk about how the playoff picture is kind of shaking out, and of course, how all of that will impact the betting markets here for week 17. Then we'll finish up with a look at the West Division in the NHL. We got three shows left until the NHL regular season begins. So we'll talk about the West Division today, probably a couple of divisions next week, and then the last division the day before the NHL regular season. So definitely looking forward to talking some pucks with Brian here on today's show after we discuss all of this Week 17 stuff in the NFL. Over at ATS.io, we've got you covered for Week 17 in the NFL for the upcoming bowl games, for the college basketball and the NBA seasons. Lots of great content from a very talented cast of writers over there. We encourage you to head on over to the website and check out those picks and predictions articles, uh, my opening line report for the NFL, my situational betting article every week for the NBA, looking at scheduling spots and some of the different compromising things that teams have to deal with. Lots of helpful handicapping content over at the website and a plethora of helpful handicapping content in the ATS app as well, which you can download in the Google Play Store, in the Apple Store. You can read about that over at ATS.io. And if you read that on a mobile device, you can click the direct links to the app in both the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. If you are going to search for the ATS app, make sure you search against the spread. That'll be the easiest way for you to find that. Finally, going to be lots of sportsbook promotions, I'm sure, as we head on into the new year here this weekend. Keep it locked over at ATS.io, where we'll write about those top sportsbook promotions for you to take advantage of this week and beyond. With that, we bring on today's guest. That is Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And Brian, how's it going today, man? All right, Adam, we made it. Week 17, hard to believe. It is hard to believe. A lot of people wondering if we'd have an NFL season at all, and we make it to week 17, and, you know, barring something happening this week in a game that doesn't matter, everybody's going to play 16 games. So, uh, you know, great job by the NFL, by the players, by everybody buying in. And, of course, we did have some hiccups along the way, but they found a way to make it work for the most part, even forcing the Browns into a kind of a tough situation last weekend. Yeah, I mean, talk about horrible timing for that to happen. But other teams have had issues, and, uh, you know, it's part of the equation. That one seemed to be a pretty harmless thing. Where, But, it, you know, it, it it's crazy how when it hits, it, it seems to impact a position. You know, if it's a, a batch of wide receivers or the tight end room in meetings get it or the, in the defensive linemen, uh, just horrible timing that you wipe out an entire position like the wide receiver core, which, which kind of made you one dimensional, which made, can you explain to me? And I know the jets have a good run defense, but how does Cleveland with Chubb and hunt in a game where you're throwing to practice squad, wide receivers only run the ball 18 times. How does that happen? Well, I think there were a couple of things. I mean, I think Stefanski, of course, expected the Jets to load the box. I I thought throwing on early downs early in the game was a really smart idea. Try to get that pass established. Try to get the Jets thinking about it. Ultimately, the second thing was that the left side of their line was out. I mean, Jedrick Wills didn't play. Uh, Wyatt Teller, who's been hurt off and on throughout the season, he didn't play. His backup, Chris Hubbard, is hurt. Nick Harris did not play particularly well at the guard position uh, in that game. You had Ricardo Lamb in the lineup too. They weren't able to block the left side at all whatsoever. So they kind of abandoned the run thinking that their best hope was to throw the football and Baker made a lot of mistakes, didn't play particularly well. Uh, That's the big thing for me, for the Browns. I mean, look, obviously you want all of the wide receivers in there, but their offensive line issues were really obscured by the fact that, you know, it's a fantasy football world out there in the mainstream media Everyone talking about Landry missing and all these guys, Hodge and Peoples-Jones and all that. To me, the biggest problem in that game was that the offensive line was terrible. And they run a lot of plays where you've got a pulling guard and stuff like that. And they just didn't have the personnel to really do that in that game. So I think Stefanski just kind of thought, you know, hey, throwing the football gives us the best chance to win here because we're not going to open running lanes. And as it turned out, they didn't when they ran the football. They had very few chunk plays in the running game 
Uh, you know, we'll see if they make some adjustments here for the Pittsburgh game. And of course, if they get guys back. Yeah. I mean, it's, you get that situation. Now you control your own destiny. And I, you know, as we'll get to these games, you know, you see some of these numbers and they're just wacky. I mean, you're going, okay. It's, it's that big, get, always week 17 guessing game teams that have the ability to rest guys can, but will they? Well, and I mean, on the plus side for Cleveland, I mean, at least they're still in a win and you're in situation here this week against a Pittsburgh team that is expected to be resting people. And I guess we might as well start with that game where the Browns are a seven and a half point favorite at plus money or reduced juice against the Pittsburgh Steelers here, total of 44 for this game. And, and Brian, look, I mean, you have to go back to 1989 for the last time the Browns were favored by more than a field goal over Pittsburgh. And Mike Tomlin hasn't come out and said anything specifically as of yet as to who will play and who won't generally accepted that Mason Rudolph will get the start at quarterback. But other than that, you know, we don't really know who Tomlin will sit. If anybody, we don't know if he's going to try to push for that number two seed. If Buffalo sits guys and all of that, uh, you think that this line is, is a little bit high based on the information that we know now. Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm curious. It's, it's a funny dynamic. I, I've been saying all season long, I thought you could have seen it in week 16 that how much stock do you put in playing at home and basically in front of nobody. So the, the resting guys and being fresh may trump everything. Uh, that being said, you know, if you, know, you get the chance to have two home games and hope somebody upsets KC and then you're hosting the, the last game, but maybe more than anything, it's, it's more about the seating and who you would actually play. You and I had this discussion uh, the Bills win. They're the two seed. And we jokingly said, that you're a Browns guy, I'm a Bills guy, that the two teams that are dying for a playoff win would likely end up bumping into each other and one of them would be out in, in the first week. And that's the case. If if things go the way at least the odds say they would, uh, that what, Cleveland, uh, Baltimore, and, uh, well, I don't know about Miami, right? I mean, the, the, the thing is you bring in Baltimore into the equation, you know, uh, <laughs> but what it, so we're looking at these standings. That's, that's the thing trying to figure out when it's all said and done. If, if Baltimore in Cleveland, win, if Indy gets in, who, who's going to actually be the seven seed? If it's right now, if it goes the way it is, it's a, it would be Indy would be the seven seed. Is that correct? If, if Baltimore, if Cleveland, and Indy win, and well, the Bills right. beat Miami. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You know, that, that Miami game is sort of a wild card in there in terms of, you know, how invested is Buffalo, especially off of, you know, you called it a torch passing game last night on Monday Night Football where Buffalo just took it to New England pretty relentlessly for the most part. And you sort of wondered, you know, with Buffalo clinching the division and all of that, would they drive that final stake through New England's heart? And they absolutely did. That was, 20, you wonder. that was that was 20 years of that. See, that was it between the lines thing. That was literally, even though the division was decided, these guys didn't want to miss the opportunity that just so you guys know, if it mattered, we were going to stick a fork in you. I mean, and that, that was kind of an intangible thing. Uh, but now you get to the week 17 and, and technically it's a different animal, but I mean, I would just say this to you, buddy, you know, we joke about the analytics and power ratings and all these things. There, there have got to be intangible things that you need to look at for the last three weeks. I mean, as the bills have been a license to print money, play them in the first half. They've covered at least nine in a row. Now in the first half, they jump on teams and their problem had been in the beginning of the year. They let teams come back at them, but now the defense is playing better, but they start fast. That's been a license to print money. And I'll give you one more, and this is what makes me think the Week 17 thing. I, I go all the way back to my years covering the Bills. Marv Levy may have cost Thurman Thomas an MVP one year when they rested everybody in Week 17. I mean, you know, he'd, he'd have led the league in rushing. Uh, you know, three years in a row, I think it would have been he'd had broke Jim Brown's record, but they rested everybody. It's a fine line resting guys, which is the right thing to do. But 
the money maker the last three weeks, finally they upped the number last night, was Stefan Diggs. D- Diggs was 105 yards behind Kelsey going into the game to lead the league in receiving yards. Well, now he's he's ahead of him. And I, you know, who knows about players' contracts and things like that, if, about bonuses. But you know, now Diggs has 1,459 yards. Kelsey's got 1,416. Andy Reid said he's basically sitting Mahomes and Hill. He didn't mention Kelsey. Uh, but Diggs flew over his player prop. But you knew Allen was going to be looking for him because they want him to lead the league in receiving yards. And Allen and Diggs were being interviewed after the game last night. Who knows? McDermott says no decision yet. Well, Allen was being interviewed after the game last night. He's, we got one more game. We want to go out there. We want to take care of business. And, you know, like every game matters. Like it's no little thing. And, and but you watch the game. Cole Beasley, they took Diggs. They took everybody out and they left Beasley out there last night. And Beasley got hurt when he should have never been out there. Yeah, I think those are really hard things to kind of figure out, sort of trying to read between the lines, read the tea leaves, whatever you want to call it here. And and the thing about it is, you know, when I look at this line between Miami and Buffalo, Buffalo laying four and a half at home, to me, odds makers don't know what's going to happen either. This line should be higher. With the way that the Bills are playing, with the way that Miami looks offensively with Tua, and allegedly they're going back to Tua this week, which... Again, you and I have talked about this before. I think that's a mistake. I think maybe long-term he might be okay, but for right now, Fitzpatrick gives you the best chance to win. Going back to Tua, to me, this line should be six and a half, maybe seven, if you think Buffalo's going to play everybody. If Buffalo's not going to play everybody, then somewhere in the Buffalo minus one pick em range, something like that, makes a lot of sense. So to me, right now, odds makers are sitting in the middle saying, okay, well, if you want to lay four and a half or you want to take four and a half and speculate on what's going to happen, by all means, be my guest, go right ahead. But we don't know. That's the big thing about that game. We don't know who plays for Buffalo and who doesn't. If they try to keep Allen and Diggs and everybody sharp, play them in the first half, treat it like a preseason game. Well, that's the case. You already mentioned how good Buffalo has been in the first half. What if this is a 17-7, you know, 21-7 yeah. type of game at halftime? You know, who wants to chase with Miami and Tua or Fitzpatrick having to come in and erase a deficit? I think this game is completely unbettable right now until we have a better idea of of what Buffalo is going to do. Exactly. I mean, if Matt Barkley's playing, uh, honestly, the drop off Josh Allen to to Barkley is it would be the way Allen's playing seriously. And Barkley just, you know, doesn't play at all. And uh, the, the drop-off would be like if Aaron Rodgers was out for the Packers. It, it's that significant. And we would cross over where Miami would be the favorite in the game. But the one other intangible, and I would just say, I wonder if, uh, I think the Diggs thing's the thing. They, you know, they'll, they'd be monitoring Kansas City and see what, you know, what Kelsey's doing. Seriously, that, who knows if he's got a bonus for leading the league in, in receiving yards and, everybody, and they're having fun and all that stuff. Uh, so they'll be maybe scoreboard watching that a little bit. And the, the other thing is you're watching the scoreboard watching with Pittsburgh. If Pittsburgh's getting killed, they're taking everybody out. If, if Pittsburgh sees that the bills are down 10, what, what are the, is, does the Steelers mindset change during the course of that game? That's the problem. You got guys that are, they're going to teams are going to be watching the scoreboard and it's going to dictate how they're going to approach a game. But the one other little hidden thing I would throw in there is the bill stepped on the Patriots' neck to, to get rid of all that frustration. But the reality of it is Buffalo's biggest rival since I've been alive, and I mean, I'm going on, I'm in the way back machine. Their biggest rival, the fans' biggest rival, you know, the, the Brady thing and all that notwithstanding, has always been Miami. And I, I, they would they would love to be, uh, the ones to say to Miami, you know, knock Miami out. Believe me, I mean, it, it, it's called it's Miami Week in Buffalo. It, it's their biggest rival. Uh, they they would have the chance to knock them out. The other one that's squirrely. How about Baltimore and Cincinnati? Uh, don't don't forget, it was just a few years ago when a undermanned Cincinnati team knocked out Baltimore uh, on that crazy fourth down pass that Dalton threw to Boyd and knocked them out of the playoffs. Could the Bengals upset the apple cart and and you know, do it again to Baltimore. 
The, the Cincinnati dynamics are really interesting. You know, I mean, it seemed like they were going to pack it in after Joe Burrow got hurt. And then there was that scathing piece from SI about, you know, the culture and, and everything surrounding Zach Taylor and, and Lou Anarumo, the defensive coordinator. And now all of a sudden they, they just, they look invested. They look engaged, you know, and, and I mean, credit to them for that. But, you know, I sort of expected them to, you know, kind of take their ball and go home, so to speak. And, and they haven't done that at all. Back-to-back wins as a touchdown or more dog. So that one is interesting. I just think Baltimore's just, they've found that level that we've kind of expected Baltimore to play at, at least offensively. I know against the Browns, they had some defensive issues, but you know, for the most part, they've just kind of found that level. Doesn't mean I'll lay double digits here or, or anything like that. And, and that's the thing, you know, you mentioned a really good point of scoreboard watching, you know, the NFL, they're not playing all the games at the same time. I think they tried that a few years ago, but you know, you can scoreboard watch here and, and it's very easy to do. Everybody's going to know what's going on. So to me, I think derivative betting is the way to go. First halves and second halves. You know, if, if Pittsburgh goes into the room at halftime and Buffalo's beating Miami, you know, by 20, then Pittsburgh's probably going to say, well, you know what? Let's just not get anybody hurt here in the second half. As you said, if the Miami Buffalo game is kind of a toss up, then maybe Pittsburgh goes, all right, well, you know, not only can we keep the Browns out of the playoffs, But also, we could possibly move up to the two seed. So uh, just so many different factors in play that we won't really know about until pretty much, you know, either the coaches tell us exactly what's going to happen or the day of the game as these things are playing out. And the the one thing is, too, that to not go overboard. And, yeah, I get it. You beat who's in front of you. But, like, Baltimore. Yeah, oh, Baltimore. Baltimore's back. Baltimore's – and yeah, sure, in a one-off, they're dangerous. Jackson running around making plays. But Adam, I mean, the reality of this, they lose to the Patriots, they lose to the Titans, they lose to the Steelers. Okay, they get a win over the Cowboys. Well, who wasn't beating the Cowboys at the time? Then they get the miracle kind of win against the Browns. Then they beat the Jags, and they beat the Giants. I mean – the Bengals are playing hard. The Bengals beat the Steelers. And like you said, they're invested now. But you sit there and go, oh, Baltimore's back. And I'm like, are they? I mean, really, who the hell have they beaten? No, that's fair. I, uh, that's, a, that's a fair argument to make for sure. And, and again, you know, I mean, th- this is also one of those games too where, and, and this happens a lot late in the NFL regular season, you pay that premium. You know, you are paying a premium on Baltimore here with a widely regarded excellent head coach in John Harbaugh and a team that has to win. And, you know, that's the thing. I think you're paying a premium on Cleveland here. I mean, I I wouldn't lay seven and a half with Cleveland, not because of the wide receiver issues, but because of the offensive line issues where, you know, we saw Baker turn the football over, you know, we saw the offensive line struggle to open holes, not play well. That's why I wouldn't lay it with Cleveland. And also I think it's an inflated price. You're also getting some other inflated prices out here in the market, I think, with, you know, specifically, I think this New Orleans-Carolina game is kind of getting a little bit lofty. Now, New Orleans needs a win to stay number two. They cannot get number one because they lost head-to-head to the Packers. No, the I, Packers- I, 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 I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, because I spent the better part of Sunday listening to all this nonsense. My belief is if it's a three-way tie, New Orleans gets it. If, if, the, if, if the Packers lose... And if, if, if it's a three-way tie, a two-way tie, Seattle beats Green Bay, a three-way tie, I think New Orleans gets it. It's a long shot, but I believe they still have a chance for the one seed. Uh, yeah, maybe you're right, because the Saints and Seahawks didn't play each other, so we don't have a head-to-head data point I, there. I, uh, I, I swear to you, but I, I, I was searching and searching in all these various combos. I'm pretty sure that's the case. Green Bay wins, they're the one. But a two, if the three of them end up tied, New Orleans gets it. If if it's a two-way tie with Seattle and Green Bay, Seattle gets it. That I'm pretty sure that's the combo. Okay. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Definitely double check. You gotta double check all these playoff scenarios here, but that that is very true. And you know, that's an interesting one moving away from New Orleans and Carolina now that you said that. Green Bay, Chicago, Green Bay needs a win for that number one seed, as you mentioned. And, you know, the, the buy with only one buy now, I, I would say that's pretty important for a lot of these teams to go out and get. Meanwhile, Chicago wins and they're in. So, you know, it's interesting. Matt LaFleur actually called this 
a playoff game. He called it the first playoff game for Green Bay, which I, I think is a pretty interesting way to look at it in a lot of ways because you're already in, but yeah, I guess you want that buy. And Green Bay laying five or five and a half here, total of 50 and a half for this one. And the, the thing about this one to me is that, you know, how long do you put Aaron Rodgers at risk vying for the number one seed? I, you you kind of have to walk that fine line of I know. the buy is great, but I also don't want my star quarterback to get hit against a you know pretty good Bears defense. I and think it really give us I, no chance whether we get the buy or not. Well, the the buy, yes, is big, but in the in reality, like I said, I don't know that having to go and play on the road this year is is that immense a deal with one exception and that might be green bay where they're so good at playing in the snow and the crummy weather that conceivably that could be the the difference between going and not going uh but you know so if lafleur is taking that approach i think he's he's plotting the course that he wants that championship game at home yeah, that, that's a fair point. Like you said, you know, if, if you're playing for a chance to go to the Super Bowl, I, I think that's where, you know, being at home, being kind of in those more comfortable conditions, so to speak, although it could be very uncomfortable, uh, you know, in, in mid to late January in Green Bay or December in January. I, I know what month it is. In mid to late January up there in Green Bay, that's definitely something that, you know, has to be a consideration here. Also, too, if you wind up playing the Saints, you'd clearly much rather – play Drew Brees, you know, outside somewhere in cold weather than play him at home in the Superdome. That's a factor. Same thing with Russell Wilson. You'd rather have him out in the cold and all of that. One interesting one here is Tampa Bay because Tampa Bay has a very large amount of incentive to win this week. If the Rams beat Arizona with John Wolford at quarterback, which seems like a a pretty big task in and of itself, the Rams could get the five seed, which means playing Washington, play or possibly playing Dallas. You know, who knows? We'll see what it winds well, up being. Playing the Giants. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's 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 astonishing the way it all it is. But well, you knew that was going to happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, absolutely. But, but that's the thing. I mean, there is monumental incentive to be the five seed. So for Tampa Bay, that line's gone up from four and a half or five to as high as six and a half here. And I get it. And I understand why. And being the five seed is very important. And Tampa Bay should absolutely vie for that. At the same time, this Atlanta team keeps playing hard. And I don't know if it's a commentary on wanting to keep Raheem Morris around and make him the full-time head coach, but Atlanta doesn't stop trying. That's one where I think you are paying a little bit of a premium and a tad bit of inflation on the Buccaneers if you want to back them. Yeah. And the funny thing is, uh, with Brady and I'm just trying to think about this, you know, you go back to the years and who's running the show there, right? You go back to all those years with the Patriots. I don't think they ever arrested Brady, you know, when games meant nothing, I think he kept playing. And it was like last night they're saying on the broadcast, Oh, you know, uh, Belichick's upset. The bills are throwing deep on them with a big lead. And I'm like, who the hell cares? I said, he did that every time they they'd had teams down. I watched him throw. They they did it. Tampa did it against Detroit. They're up forty and they're throwing on first down. <laughs> you know, who cares if Belichick's upset? Those guys made it made a career doing the stuff like that. And you know, Brady Brady's going to go for it no matter what. He he sticks it out. But this Atlanta team, as you said, playing hard and that looks really good on paper. The Kansas City thing. I think Kansas City, it was an out-of-conference game. It, was, you know, it wasn't going to cost them anything. They knew they were going to get the one seed. Um, it's funny. I, I, if if you were hoping to have an opportunity to rest Brady, you know, is maybe the play at Tampa Bay in the first half where they can get a lead and then they rest guys that they're motivated to come out of the gate. But uh, I think there are a lot of games where Tampa actually starts slow. So I think I'm going to ask when I get to – you know, my shows during the week here with the odds makers, I'm going to ask them. I wonder if by a good margin, if halftime wagering in week 17 is bigger than any other week of the year. And and I really wonder if that's the way to go that, 
you have all these questions, but you monitor the games. You see who does care, who doesn't care. Uh, the Miami thing, I don't know what the hell they're thinking. Um, you know, I'm, two weeks in a row, we're watching those games going, you know, these are winnable games if you put Fitzpatrick in because Tua just doesn't stretch the field. You know in that game that two is on a really short leash. You know, I mean, so the second half in that game could be mightily different. Yeah. No, that's an excellent point. And I guess one thing to say about this Tampa Bay game, maybe you're not paying a premium because two weeks ago, Tampa Bay was laying five and a half on the road at Atlanta. Failed to cover, played a terrible first half, came back, won the game in the second half. Atlanta did hold on to cover the spread. But that one was five and a half on the road. This one's six and a half at home, opened lower than the road number, but got bet up. So maybe you're not paying a premium, I guess, based on the line that we saw two weeks ago. There, there's just uh, a lot of moving parts, like you said, where, uh, you know, the, the second half of number, these games are going to be different and all that. Yeah, the deflated number to me is the total because you look at the last game, Atlanta, KC, low scoring. Well, you know, it wasn't a brutal day or anything, but outside in the element, it could be windy at Arrowhead, you know, unless there's a monsoon. I mean, I could see these two teams going up and down the field. And had that been a normal Atlanta case or a normal KC game, if, if that was a game, you know, that was in the high 20s or the 30s, the total on this game would have been 53 and a half, 54 and a half. I think that the, the total's totally deflated because Atlanta's coming off a low scoring game. No, that's an excellent point. All right. So let's talk about a game that does matter for both teams. You know, a lot of this is speculation here uh, in week 17. Obviously, Green Bay, Chicago matters for both teams. But, you know, other than that, a lot of these games, it, it matters a lot more for one team than another. A game that really matters for both teams here is Dallas and the Giants. Game 107, 108, up to three now with Dallas, pretty much market-wide, although it's reduced juice out there. Totals crashed down to 44 and a half for this game, was 47 the Giants need a win and a Washington loss to Philadelphia. The Cowboys need a win and Washington loss to Philadelphia. So both of these teams can at least give themselves a chance going into Sunday night football. But so far, it's been you know pretty steady Dallas money. Yeah, and if there's just a part of me that says that any NFC East game, no matter where it's being played, you should just make pick. Because is any one of those teams good enough to be favored over anybody? I would say, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm getting points. I'll take the points. You know, I, I don't, you know, you can't trust any one of them. Yes, Dallas, it, Pollard's helped. Elliott and Pollard, Lamb had a breakout game. I think that the Eagles are, you know, was such a dog's breakfast. And the Giants thing you know, this is just a real function of what people last witnessed. But, I mean, honestly, uh, the Giants are on a three-game losing streak. All right, well, Jones was hurt. But the way they played defensively against Seattle was pretty impressive. Beating Cincinnati doubt doesn't look so bad, does it? And, you know, in the division games, the Giants had been winning those games. All right, they, they lose to Arizona. Jones wasn't there. The, the Browns, you know, are a solid team. And then they lose to the Ravens. I, I don't think there's a, you look at the three game losing streak, but they actually lost to some, you know, teams that really cared. Uh, and now it's a one-off. I, I'm, I'm taking points. I, I, just, I just don't trust any of these guys. I'll thank you. I'll just start the game ahead. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, you look at the giants and, and they haven't exceeded 17 points or they haven't exceeded 19 points in five games. So, I think that's what kind of people, what people are looking at here is that Dallas has that offensive upside. And in fact, they've shown it these last three weeks. The Giants don't have any offensive upside, whether it's Daniel Jones or Colt McCoy, they just don't have any. So I think that's why people prefer Dallas in this game. But then, ironically enough, the total's coming down. You would think that if you liked Dallas, you would expect maybe a higher scoring expectation that Dallas would outscore the Giants because Dallas's defense isn't great, but we're seeing the total come down, the side go up. Maybe that's a commentary on the Giants' offense and just how poorly graded it is 
uh, across the the sports betting landscape here. But that's one that is really interesting. And I mean, uh, I would at this point now that Dallas is three, I wouldn't bet either side. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would have to take the Giants if anything. But I, I just what I've seen from the Giants here of late, just the returns are so poor offensively, and the defense is kind of cracking a little bit in some respects. That I, I think the money on Dallas might be the right side, but. I also understand where you're coming from in terms of these teams are so interchangeable for the most part and so unreliable that, you know, kind of defaulting to the dog makes some sense. So with that in mind, you know, (laughs) Washington will have to win on Sunday night football and money has come in on them now with Dwayne Haskins out of the picture. We'll see if it's Alex Smith. It could be Taylor Heineke, who knows, but Washington has a road favorite here in a must win type of situation that seems like a tough bet to make here too. Well, again, you know, when we're trying to read the tea leaves here, the Washington thing to me, and I don't know how detailed he got in his explanation, but last week he's saying, all right, with our defense, I think we can, we got a shot. We can win this game with Haskins. You know, the kid turns into a box of rocks during the week and all that. It, but I think his thinking was now this calf could be so bad that maybe, you know, Smith just couldn't have gone, but he had the luxury of knowing he had that game and still another win in your in game that he said, I think we have a chance to win this game without Smith, but if we throw him out there at 70% and he re aggravates the thing, we're toast on a stick. So giving him the extra week, you know, it was all about try to give him the time. Maybe they get maybe they get the win. They didn't. But now Smith, even if Smith 70%, you can go. And the added bonus was that Heineke came in and did some okay things for them. And and the getting rid of Haskins thing in the room, you know, sends a message to the players like, you know, listen, we're all buying in. This guy wasn't. Uh, I think that that actually on top of the I want to make the playoffs – is another motivator for these guys. But I I think we're very, it would be very interesting to know if he had to play, could Smith have played last week? Yeah, I think it's a fair question to ask. And, you know, what's, what's really challenging for me about this handicap here is I Washington's defense is very, very strong to say the least. And it's, it's the reason why they're in this position. Philadelphia, they had that little blip where offensively with Jalen hurts, they, they kind of had, they were energized a little bit. You know, it it wasn't Carson Wentz. It was something different. It was something new. It was something that kind of took them out of that monotonous mindset that they had gotten into with Wentz, where, you know, it was just sort of, well, how many turnovers and bad throws is this guy going to give us? Then last week, the defense falters and they lose by 20 to Dallas. So you look at Philadelphia here and, and you sort of say to yourself, okay, they can directly impact this playoff race, but, are they motivated? Are they sufficiently you know, invested in this game where you would hope they show up for Jalen Hurts, but at the same time, this is a team that, you know, pardon the pun, has been hurting all year with a ton of injuries on both sides of the ball. Are these guys just kind of ready for the end of it? And do they just sort of roll over for Washington, you know, regardless of who wins that early game? That would be the fear for me with Philadelphia of, I don't know if that competitive spirit is really going to be there for them, especially because they could potentially improve their draft position a little bit too. Well, and and the other thing, you know, it's such a short sample size uh, that, you know, listen, give them credit, right? They beat the saints. Uh, Everybody's like, Whoa, okay. Uh, And this kid's running around making plays and you know, which is more prevalent here that this kid's out there and he's getting his feet wet and he's learning the ropes and he's getting reps and he's playing games. But the other thing is these defensive coordinators, these guys aren't stupid. Well, now you got like three games worth of tape on the guy. And what were the things that they were doing for Hertz uh, other than you know, his mobility and the, the good things he can do went out of the pocket, but what were they doing that were successful? Now, it doesn't take long. I always go back to the old wildcat with the Dolphins. Boy, that thing was, you know, reinventing the league. And after they got five games worth of tape on it, the thing never was seen again. And I think the Redskins, they see tape. They know what are the things that Hurts does well, and that defense is playing lights out. So 
you know, to me, I think as good as Hertz is, and or at least well, as good as he's been, and maybe the upgrade he'd given them, I think the more that you see this guy in action, you know, the things they put in to make him be successful, that defense may be able to take that away because there's a little sample out there of what it is he's been doing. And if they take that away from him, he's still a kid in the first month of his career. No, I think those are all great points there regarding Hertz. Before we transition over to the NHL so we can talk about the West Division for a few minutes, anything else from this NFL Week 17 card that, that we didn't discuss that you think we should? Uh, again, like all of this stuff is between the line stuff. You know, Indy's a 14 point favorite Jacksonville, you know, they've looked like they've run for the bus, but now that they know they've got Lawrence, there's, they got, you know, whatever. And not that the players care look what the jets did the last few weeks. You know, you wonder if Jacksonville's pulling out trick plays and goofy stuff. And does Jacksonville show up with one good effort uh, or, or does Indy absolutely destroy them? Uh, you know, I, I, who knows what you're getting there. The Tennessee-Houston game, again, total intangible thing. In Tennessee, win, you win the division. But J.J. Watt called these guys out, man. He, I mean, he literally, that, that post-game thing where he basically said guys were rolling over like dogs, and he called them out. And I wonder if Houston doesn't show up with a big effort uh, in the last game just because of that, that thing that Watt said and none of that stuff's power ratings or, you know, it's all between the line stuff, but it's stuff that matters. Yeah. I wonder about that with Houston too. And I also wonder, you know, seems like JJ Watt may want to move on as well after this season and may have the opportunity to do that. You know, is that something where Houston just you know doesn't quite respond to their leader? I mean, that could be a possibility in that one. Seattle and San Francisco. I mean, Seattle laying five and a half here on the road against the 49ers who, I mean, look, CJ Beathard is a lot better than Nick Mullins, it would appear. So San Francisco with a little bit of life last week, chance for them to kind of directly impact uh, what happens there with Seattle's seeding. Seahawks, of course, winning the division last weekend against the Rams. But, you know, that's one where I wouldn't expect a Kyle Shanahan team to roll over. I wouldn't expect that at all. And, and still some very good defensive personnel the offense, you know, a lot of guys that have been hurt on the COVID list, all that. I think San Francisco is the type of team, and this is something that's important to think about too. These teams that are used to playing for something, but they're not, you know, a team like Houston, for example, they're used to playing for the division this weekend or, you know, seating or something like that. They're not, you know, do some of these teams that have this culture of winning, do they show up and say, you know what, let's win this last game. Let's build off of something positive going into the off season. I don't know if that applies to Houston with the turmoil and transition there, but I think for San Francisco, it very well could. I won't be surprised if San Francisco wins that game outright against Seattle. Mm-hmm. I mean, of all the games in the meaningless game, I mean, is, is the worst number out there? Should the total on the Minnesota Detroit game be 74? I, if Matt Stafford doesn't play, I, I don't know how Detroit does offensively. Yeah, but I mean Minnesota might get the over themselves if if they really <laughs> want to. So, what about Vegas and Denver? I guess we didn't talk about that game because it doesn't really matter at all. But is that one where you're kind of looking, you know, for the over and for a lot of points in a game where there's just not a whole lot at stake? That's a weird one, man. I mean, the the Raiders' defense is just a disaster, and Denver. Locke is Jekyll and Hyde, that kid, man. I mean, you know, he could throw four. He could throw four picks. You got to check the weather always in Denver. But, you know, that that could be a goofball, high-scoring game. Both teams are out of it. Yeah, I think there's – I mean, there's a lot to consider. And, again, this will be a lot of very fluid situations during the day. So, live betting, second-half betting, stuff like that, the way to go. Are we over – thinking it uh should we just play the under in the uh, arizona rams game under 39 and a half oh, lowest God. lowest posted total we've seen right this year i mean i i don't know how much the rams score but i don't know it's hard to take an under with with kyler murray and all the the dynamic players on that arizona side also to me walford might have some turnovers deep in his own territory that lead to you know short scoring drives i the one thing that's interesting about that, and just in general, and I've heard this talked about on a lot of shows, and I maybe haven't 
harped on it enough here. The Rams do not perform well offensively at home. And, and that that SoFi Stadium playing surface seems to be very slow, kind of thick, um, you know, that, that synthetic grass surface there in that dome stadium. I don't know what it is, but the Rams have been much better offensively on the road. Not what we'd expect with Jared Goff and all the talk of his small hands and, and everything like that, but the Rams have not performed well offensively at home. So maybe there's some sort of angle there for the future. I don't know if it's applicable here with such a low total, but yeah, I, I wouldn't expect much offensively from the Rams there. No. Well, you know, small hands or whatever, doesn't it just go all the way back to the hard knocks thing when Goff was in the blimp as a rookie quarterback and he didn't know that the sun rises in the East and sets in the West. Isn't that kind of the starting point? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've I've seen some people recently really <laughs> question Jared Goff's intelligence level, his ability to read a defense, his ability to get into the playbook. There may be something to that. And, and I, how about, buddy, the season? Well, the division's on the line. The horrible, you know, the horrible throw he made, notwithstanding, you know, like you say, you would watch a Josh Allen do things and the team goes nuts, you know, that he'll take on a linebacker. Maybe it's not smart, but you know, but, but we're, we're following that guy everywhere he goes. Uh, that, that was the most hideous thing I've ever seen. It was a third down. He's scrambling and he's got the first down and there are two guys that are that coming at him, but he's got the first down. If he puts his head down and he slides a yard and a half short of the first down with the division on the line and they had a punt. Uh, that's not good. No. That is uh, that is not good at all whatsoever. All right, let's transition over to the NHL side of things here for a little bit. And um, some very concerning news coming out this morning here from the Chicago Blackhawks about Jonathan Taves, who will miss the start of training camp and an indefinite period of time with a uh, yet-to-be-diagnosed illness. And, of course, you know, anytime you talk about illnesses in athletes that keep them out of action, it's a very, very scary thing. So the Blackhawks likely without Jonathan Taves for the next little while. They are in the central division this year. Everything you know, realigned a little bit uh, around. Oh, by the, the way, end. just, just to tack on that, they lose Kirby Doc, their stud who broke his, had, broke his wrist, just had surgery. He's going to be out five months. He broke his wrist in the World Juniors. And they also lose, uh, lost Nylander to a knee injury. So they've not even shown up at camp yet. And they've lost three of their top six. Yeah, it's uh, not not a great state of affairs there for Chicago, who was you know already in a pretty difficult division with the the realignment here in the Central Division. Um, you know what? I, should we just talk Central Division today instead, and then just uh, talk West next week? All right, let's go ahead and just talk Central Division here. You know, just with the Taves news, we can talk West next week, maybe West and uh, and North next week, and then maybe the East the week after that. But here in the Central Division, I mean, the Blackhawks were already going to be up against it anyway. A very good Tampa Bay Lightning team, maybe the best team in the NHL. The Carolina Hurricanes are an excellent team as well. Dallas Stars, of course, made a deep run in the bubble. Columbus, they're always a feisty team. Maybe Nashville takes a step forward here this year. The Panthers, they always have talent. It's really about goaltending and and how well they get performance there in the net. And then Detroit, a bottom feeder. But you know, here in the Central Division, Tampa Bay plus 135 at BetMGM Sportsbook, Carolina plus 400, Dallas plus 500, Columbus plus 700, Nashville 700, Chicago 1200, but that will go down now uh, with that Taves news. Those are odds to win the division here. What about the Central Division, which, you know, is is pretty spread out here. And, you know, the interesting thing about the Central, I think, is that Unlike a lot of these other geographic divisions where these teams are playing each other all the time, this one's kind of a mix and match of both conferences where it may take a little more time for familiarity and some of the bad blood to develop. Yeah, listen, I mean, Tampa Bay's the the favorite, uh, deservedly so, but they lose Kucherov, uh, you know, the hard trophy winner. They just traded Coburn and Paquette to the senators who are, you know, solid core players because of cap constraints. And then you get the Stanley cup hangover thing a little bit. I mean, it's a really good hockey team. And I still think they have to make another move or two because they've got such salary cap issues, you know, that 
the bottom line is you just get in. The, the, the difference is there's no conference anymore. So you, you just got to, when you get to the playoffs, get out of your division. And fans aren't a thing. So, you know, Tampa Bay is going to be fine. Um, but in terms of the regular season, to me, the team I would play on is Carolina uh, at four to one. Now, the goaltending is still, I wouldn't, it's not great. It's not hideous if you've got a, you know, Mrazic and Reimer. And I think they're kind of the same goalie, but I love the team. I think it's a really good team. And the thing is, when you're handicapping games this year, and I can't wait for this to start, I think the intensity, the way that's going to ratchet up is going to be something special and all the back-to-back matchups. I think those things are going to be, you know, really something to watch. But you got to handicap the backup goalie, too. I think the goal, the backup goalie is going to play less games than they normally play total games, but a higher percentage. And, you know, if you you win the first game of a back to back, you know, you're maybe you're playing your backup and the other team goes, we can't lose two in a row. So we're coming right back with our starter in, in the second game. You know, the handicap's going to be terrific. Now for Tampa Bay, as good as they are, they got Vasilevsky. But Curtis McElaney is the backup. I mean, he's not hideous, but he's, he's certainly, you know, ain't nothing to write home about either. So I, li- I kind of like Carolina in the regular season uh, in that division. At four to one, I think that's, you know, it's a semi decent price. Let me ask you this about, uh, you know, really both Tampa Bay and Dallas here. Quick turnaround, you know, coming out of the bubble, obviously these players had a long period of time off with the COVID 19 pandemic got back at it, you know, played sort of those qualifying round games, then played the games in the bubble where they actually, you know, got through the playoffs and, of course, crowned a champion. With Tampa Bay and Dallas, do do you worry about, you know, maybe a a bubble hangover, so to speak, with this quick turnaround? Yeah, I mean, that's actually something to consider. I think uh, the funny thing is we're kind of seeing it on display in the World Juniors, and like I'm watching a bunch of prospects really closely, and I'm watching them like, huh, okay, well, wait a minute. Now they're into the third and fourth game, and like, oh, okay, there it is. Well, like those kids hadn't played a game, I mean, a game since March. And you could see them all shaking the rust off, and you're sitting there, you know, forming an opinion on a guy when collectively the passing and all the things that were off because they've been off so long. And you know, they talk about the seven teams that missed the playoffs haven't played since March, uh, but those teams are going to be just champing at the bit. And don't, I mean, Dallas and Tampa went that long gauntlet, but a lot of these other teams, they were eliminated too. So they really haven't played that much hockey either. So it's going to be really interesting. To see. And, and by the way, if you can play yourself out of the playoffs in October in a normal year, you know, you start one and five in this sprint, you're in trouble. So the start is critical. The start is critical. 56 game regular season here. You play everybody in your division seven times in the North division. It's a little bit different. Uh, where or you play everyone in your division eight times, excuse me. In the North division, it's a little bit different where you might play a team a couple extra times because there's one fewer Canadian team. Uh, so there's seven in that division, eight in all the other ones. You mentioned the importance of the backup goaltender, and it's why I think a team like Columbus might be fairly dangerous here, where sure. both Corpusalo and Merz Lickens played really well last year at various points. I mean, there were some points where you know Merz Lickens specifically looked like the young guy that he is, but you know, Corpusalo played very well. Then he got hurt. They had to rely on Merz Lickens. They wound up having different guys called up from the AHL to be the backup. That'll be something else that's interesting, too, in terms of your taxi squad keeping those guys sharp with the AHL, maybe not playing at all this year. Uh, That'll be kind of an interesting development too. I don't know if Columbus has enough top end scoring in a division like this, but they certainly have the goaltending and, you know, a very deep roster where they can roll all four lines and do so pretty comfortably for John Tortorella there. Cause that's important too. You're going to have a little bit of a condensed schedule. You're going to play some back-to-backs in the same cities and stuff like that. Depth is going to be a, a big factor here, I think, for a lot of these teams. Some of these teams may have a lot of top-end skill, not have a lot of great bottom six or bottom pairing guys. So that's something where that could give Columbus a little bit of an advantage that you know they're a deep team where they trust a lot of guys in a lot of situations. 
Well, you know, you can make the case that Merzlikens and Corposalo would be the starter on, you know, at least a third of the league. I mean, so you, you can make the case you got a one and a one A there, and that's that's a really good thing. The one thing I think you're really going to have to take into account here, you know, an 82 game season. Uh, you know, your home is the four or five game home stand, and it's a Tuesday in January. You know, uh, okay, for argument's sake, it's Vegas, and you know, in comes Columbus or in comes Florida. It's just a game, you know, and then it's the scheduling thing. And now we played three and four nights and we're tired and guys can't play at a crazy level for 82 games. But what happens now, all these games, you are, everybody is playing at least the same opponent twice. And in some instances, it's three and four times in a row, they're playing the same team. Coaching becomes a real big thing. Not that it's not always, but a coach is going to sit there in the middle of a get out of conference game and maybe shuffle of lines and try to make an in-game adjustment. But when you're playing the same team in the next game, now the coaching and the adjustments become so much more prevalent where, okay, they did this, this is their strength. Let's take this away from them that, I think the coach has become an even bigger component in handicapping games. You know, it's because when you get in a series, like a Columbus is a matchup nightmare, you know, because Tortorella is a good coach and then they know how to adjust during the course of a series and there's no, no quit in them. I just think the coaching is such a bigger deal this year than other years. I, I, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not diminishing the importance of coaching all the time, but when you're going to be playing the same team in, two or three games in a row, the, the way the coach is going to approach it and tinker and tweak things becomes way different than anything we've ever seen before. No, that's a, I think it's a phenomenal point because again, you know, you're playing these teams eight times each. And as I said, the North division is a little bit different. You may see somebody nine times, eight times each. So you're going to see a lot of the same team and you're going to have to make those adjustments, whether it's a back to back or playing, you know, more than two games in a row or just simply the fact that every game is magnified, playing only 56 of them, that if you start 0-3 against the team or 0-4 against the team, something like that, you better make an adjustment. If you start 0-2 against the team, you better make an adjustment. And I agree. I think coaching will make such a significant, uh, you know, matchup advantage for some of these teams here. Because again, you're seeing the same team eight times now, as opposed to, like you said, Maybe you go on that California swing. Maybe you're Tampa Bay or Florida or Carolina or something like that. You go on that California swing, you play three games in four days. You don't see those teams again for maybe months. Or maybe you play those California teams twice in you know October and November, and then you don't play them again. Now you're seeing the same team eight times at least to the point where you do have to make those adjustments. You do have to have those coaching advantages. And it could be one of those things where – you know, we hear all the time in college basketball, oh, it's hard to beat a team three times in the same year. Not if you're better than them. Not if your coach is better than their coach is. We could see some very one-sided head-to-head series this season that will have a significant impact on that playoff race because, again, one-seventh of your regular season games are going to be against the same team. So if one team dominates the other, that may not be something that changes as the year goes along. Well, I think a lot of the things that worked over the years, I don't say you throw them out. I think there'll still be things that will will apply. But I would say almost as a starting point, I I would always be looking at the team that lost the first game in 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 one of those mini series. I would I would look for them and I think, you know, the number will reflect, oh, this team beat them. So they were $1.30 in the first game, and they beat them 5-1. Now they're $1.70 in the next game. I'd be looking at the dog as a starting point, at least, uh, knowing you're going to get a really hard, big effort. Nobody can afford two, three, four-game losing streaks. I, I would start doing that. Then I think when you get into, uh, you know, pick a matchup, say, I don't know, the, the Flyers and the, the Sabres, that maybe the Flyers win – the first two game, first two game series in, you know, January, and then they they come back and then they play at the end of February. 
I'd be looking at and say the Flyers won the first two games. I'd be looking at the Sabres, say, in the first game of the next series because the coaches then have that ability to make those kind of adjustments and come in with a completely different approach. I think there's going to be barking dogs everywhere. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and I also think, too, and we'll talk more you know, the day before the season about you know some of these situational angles and stuff like that that you and I like to consider. But you know, if you're the Flyers, and, and let's say you sweep a two-game set against the Penguins, and then next you're playing the Devils, you know, you're going to be pretty happy with yourself to have beaten the Penguins twice, a team that you'll likely be jockeying for playoff position with. You may have a setback against the Devils in that first game. You know, So those are things that we'll be taking a look at on a, on a micro level, on a game-by-game -game basis level here throughout the course of the season. And I will once again be doing a situational betting article for the NHL over at ATS.io uh, once this season gets going. Lastly, Brian, not an NHL point, but I did just see, and, and as awful as Twitter is, it's going to be very helpful here for this week. Uh, the Steelers have officially announced it will be Mason Rudolph, but Tomlin has not made any other determinations about the rest of the team. So, Again, we'll be very fluid. Make sure you keep up on the news, but you know, that sort of confirms what we already expected and obviously what the line expected as well. Yeah, and I who knows? Okay, so this, the Steelers say that, and you know, it's like trusting the information you're going to get in a preseason game, how much a guy's going to play and all this, but I don't know that it will, but could that news impact Buffalo's thinking in terms of, you know, are they resting guys? I mean, Buffalo, Buffalo, Pittsburgh vying for the two seed. I mean, does that officially make McDermott and the Bills think, man, maybe we're crazy to put Allen out there. I, I, this is the nature of week 17. Yeah, most definitely is. And I'm sure you'll do a lot of talking about that on your show, Sportsbook Radio on the Sports Grid Radio Network. And, uh, Obviously, you got a lot to talk about on the NHL front with Vegas Hockey Hotline as well. Yeah, and my friend Adam's joining me today, uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. That guy's an Eastern. asshole. Why would you want him on your show? Um, he can talk. <laughs> uh, 2 o'clock Eastern on the Sports Grid Radio Network. Adam's joining me for the hour today. Uh, we're on 2 to 4 Eastern. Uh, Sportsbook Radio, Tony Neville will be on from Treasure Island today. And we do Vegas Hockey Hotline if you're a hockey fan. Uh, you can get all that on my Twitter at Brian Blessing. There's a listen live function at KSHP.com. That's 1 o'clock Pacific time if you're a hockey fan. Uh, always a lot of fun stuff in the hockey show as well. So a lot of cool stuff, and we're excited about the sports grid thing going on Sirius 204 on January 7th. Oh, definitely looking forward to that. Always great to ch chat here with Brian Blessing, the host of Sportsbook Radio and Vegas Hockey Hotline. And, uh, Brian, I'll talk to you again later. Buddy, always a pleasure. There you go. There's Brian Blessing again, sportsbookradio.com, uh, Vegas Hockey Outline, KSHP.com, and you can check him out on that Sports Grid Radio Network as well. And you can hear me today uh, to give some more thoughts on the NFL and whatever else Brian decides he wants to talk about. Make sure you follow him on Twitter as well, at Brian Blessing. And he's got four videos up over on our ATS YouTube page for you to check out. I'm going to take Wednesday off. I've had a lot going on here in my personal life over the last week, week and a half. So I'm going to take Wednesday off from the show. We'll be back Thursday with Brad Powers to talk college football and the NFL. I'll be back on Friday as well to talk about Circa Sports Million for week 17. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Or, well, actually, you know what? I'll talk to you again on Thursday.